stuff from the talk I gave at RSA this year. And it's essentially advice from one guy who really loves logs and spends a lot of time in them to other people that also have logs. Um, several years ago at RSA when, when uh, APTs became the big scary buzzword of the year, um, I went to several presentations and at RSA you have to end your talk with, by the way, are we, are we, are we working on the recording? I should have checked. We're good. Okay. Um, Cause I'll just I'll just roll along unless someone stops me, um, but you always have to end an RSA talk with an action slide, which is it can't be vendor specific, it can't be um, pumping your solution, it has to just be advice that those people can take home and immediately apply in their environment and be safer. And the the way that all six group discussions, panel discussions, and presentations ended in talking about APTs was you got to love your logs. Okay, you can't rely on the vendor to catch stuff for you in this kind of this kind of a scenario and so the more alert you are and the more familiar you are with what's normal in your logs the better you'll be at catching stuff so that that kicked off some some thoughts in my head and one of those thoughts was it'd be really cool to do a talk where the whole talk was action slide stuff not focused on any particular tool but just um, principles that you could use in in your defense since so that's where this came from so we've, we've got a fundamental problem here in IT and it hits us over and over again and you'll hear this like the user is the weak link in security there's no patch for stupid yada 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 right we all have users who are trying to keep safe we put up defenses this is a blue team talk if you can't tell we're trying to keep them safe and yet there are some users that whether it's out of curiosity or stubbornness or stupidity or what it is it's something human though and they want to get outside the fence so one of our field engineers heard the talk and he found this picture and sent it to me. And it was just a classic. I had to put it in there. Eh, the bad guys will never catch me. And and then so I started to think, well, th there's a way we can use this. Okay. And I'll tell you how. I, I like stories. And so let me tell you a foolish zebra story. So this is how this all, all started. Well, the, the, the actual trigger. So several years ago, there was a really cool malware network that I was following. I call it the dangerous wares network because what they had done is they had set up a whole bunch of sites that looked like they had wares available. I'm just going to show you some of them. Um, some were called download portals. Uh, this one was a movie site. You can get not, not just like softwares, but movie wares. And uh, some of them were couched in terms of a software review site where you could read about the software. And I like this one. That's like this is the bubbly little friendly wares portal. Like if I were doing a wares portal, I would not use this kind of a design scheme. I would like make it look more hackerish, right? But they made it bubbly. Okay. So the idea was is that Google and Bing and the other search engines are very agnostic toward things like porn and wares and, and anything else going on. And so if you search for something, they will return a list of sites that claim to have that sort of content, right? And so the way this network worked is they set up dozens and dozens and dozens of these fake sites, got them indexed by the search engines, and these sites did not host malware. And so they stayed in the search engines for a long time. They were very sticky. There was no one complaining, hey, Google, take this down. This is evil. And what would change day to day, every day, that, that constantly the list of the, of, the, of the programs that were being featured would change, but the links always took you off-site to go get the wares, right? And what you always got was malware. And it was named to match whatever it was you thought you were clicking on. Okay, whether it was a movie or a, or a Windows antivirus program or whatever it was, you got back something named just like that. And so I was always um, wanting to know if any new sites like this came online, right? And I also wanted to know where they were pointing that point in time. And so I spent a lot of time watching this network, and if I saw the links on these sites that I followed change as far as where the destinations were, I knew, oh, they've got a new malware server online. And if I ever saw traffic to one of those new malware servers that wasn't coming from one of these sites, I know, oh, they've got a new where site online with the fake bait, right? So it's a little virtual, virtuous feedback cycle, okay? And so one day in the logs, one of my users was going out to grab one of these malware payloads. And we always assume, we give our users the benefit, the big benefit of a doubt, we assume they are not deliberately going out to infect themselves. Okay? 
That may be a leap for some users, right? But they're, they're doing something else and the malware happens. And so my particular area of interest in life is studying those vectors. How do the bad guys get the users diverted from something innocent and worthwhile, or at least not too time wasting, and get them to the malware? And so I jump back to see where this guy had come from. Because again, like I say, if, if there's a new one of these sites back then serving this, I want to know about it. And I recognized the name of the site that the guy had come from. And I said, now wait a minute. If I'm pretty sure that I recognize the name of that domain. I think I personally rated that site as malware, as one of these, like months ago or a week ago, or, you know, like, you know, a long time ago. So I checked the database, and yes, Chris Larson had indeed rated that site as malware like four weeks ago. So I thought, well, how did the user get to the site that we already knew was an evil site to even click on the link to go get what he thought was his Microsoft Excel cracked version. And so in, in going back and reconstructing the whole chain, he had started at Google. He had searched for Microsoft Excel cracked version. Google had presented him a list of sites that said they had that. He'd clicked on one. It was, it was one of these. He'd gone there. He'd scrolled down. He'd found the Microsoft Excel link. He'd clicked it. Now, oh, sorry. So he had clicked on the link in Google. And then he was trying to get to the site, and then this was one of our canine users. Canine is a free web filter that Bluecoat gives away. We, a bunch of us engineers that are dads and have kids, convinced management several years ago this would be a good idea to give something away free so that families could protect their kids. Because we had friends asking, what should I do to keep my kids away from bad stuff on the internet? And this is when I, when I talk at a hacker conference, I always have to put in a plug for canine. Because A, it's not RSA, and because B, a lot of hackers like surfing porn, and they've never thought about putting a web filter on their own computer, right? That doesn't make sense. But I say, look, you, you, can, you can set K9 to let the porn through, but just make sure you block the dirty half dozen, the malware, the botnet, the pus, that's like adware stuff, spam, phishing, and suspicious, right? Block those six, surf whatever else you want. So this user was a, was a K9 user. Um, from the license key, and so he'd, so he'd come to, and K9 had put up the block page, right, before he got to this site. Do not go here. This is rated malware, and your policy says, stop me from going to malware. Now, because K9 is a free home product, whoever installs it is the admin, and you have the password, and so if you ever get blocked, you can put your password in and override it. Parents do this when they block kids from going to porn, and then the kids are doing an image search on Google or something, and and the site comes up that gets blocked, and they need mommy to un unblock this. I've got to get this for my homework. Um, hopefully, the mom reads the site name before she unblocks it. Um, and so he hadn't trusted what the good guys are telling him. He trusted the social engineering of what the bad guys were telling him. And so he put his password in and overrode the block page. All right. Then he clicked on the link to go get what he thought was the cracked version. And even though that was a new site, we recognized the characteristics of the executable he was requesting and said, nope, 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 another block page pops up. He puts his password in again and overrides it, and he goes and gets the malware. Okay, now as an engineer, my first reaction is, I've got to build a better fence. Right? The fence wasn't strong enough. The dumb user got through. All right? And so I went down the hall to... Uh, to talk to the manager who's over the development there, I said, Todd, we've got to fix K9. We've got to make the malware block page different from the normal block page, like put a skull and crossbones or a flashing red border. Like, we really mean this. This is dangerous. Don't go here. He wouldn't do it. He wouldn't commit himself like a good project manager. He just said, I'll think about it. That sounds like a pretty good feature. We'll try and get done on this someday. So I was really annoyed that at first that he wouldn't just like take my great ideas and, and make somebody put them in, right? So then by the time I made it back to my desk, though, I, I'd rethought this, and I said, no, this is actually cool. I'm looking at this all wrong. This anonymous canine user, whoever he was, has just sacrificed himself for the good of the rest of the herd. And that's where the zebra herd idea came from, right? Because he's still got canine on his computer, and canine is still going to be checking in with Bluecoat's cloud to say, hey, what's this site rated? What's this site rated? What's this site And his computer is going to be going places that none of my corporate or government or education users could be going because they could not have overridden the block page the way he did. All right? 
And so I pulled out that zebra's web traffic for a day after that and just watched to see where he went. And lo and behold, he led me to a bunch of malware sites that I wouldn't have known about otherwise. Would have been, well, I, I could have found them, right? but it would have been a lot harder. It's a lot easier if someone just says, by the way, here's a bunch of malware sites. Right? So the idea then is that the zebra principle is because this is deeply ingrained in, in the human psychology, your users are going to be doing this. You arguably cannot stop them from behaving this way. All right. So the pragmatic way to look at this is rather than get mad at them or to um, treat them as the bane of my existence, I'm going to say, can we turn these into volunteer beta testers of our network security and use them as an asset? All right, so that's what we're going to, we're going to do. And I have to, by, by the way, I have to say my boss made me put this in. <laughs> our zebras are anonymous in our logs. I don't know who that guy was, right? To find out, I would have had to pull his license, go down the hall to Todd, the, the incorrigible guy who wouldn't put the feature in for me, and say, Todd, I need to know who this guy is. It's vitally important. And then I have to convince Todd, and you already know how good that would go, right? So, bonus question is what do you do if you're like the IT guy and your CEO is a foolish zebra. Okay, there's a whole separate set of issues with that. We'll, we'll get to that if we can. So, the rest of this talk. So, regardless of what you're, what we're talking about, it could be firewall, it could be web filter, it could be IDS, it could be desktop antivirus. Whatever logs you're looking at, you will have users whose behavior will be different from the other zebras in the herd, and that's where you should start to get interested. So. Basic idea, how do you find your foolish zebras? Um, one idea is you look for zebras that have unusually high levels of traffic compared to the rest of the herd, or they have unusual traffic patterns. This is not what this talk is about. So there's a one slide tutorial on patterns, then we'll go on. So this is what normal web browsing looks like for one user. This is not normal. And this is not normal. So if you see stuff like that, go investigate. What we're instead going to spend the time on is talk about risky areas, okay? Especially if we're in the area of web filtering, which is where I play. Then you want to know: Are there certain areas that are riskier than others? And the answer is yes. I'm going to tell you about those. And so we want to identify those kinds of areas and look for zebras that are trying to get into those areas or that have a lot of traffic compared to the other zebras. And so this is where your security team would get together, and we're, we're thinking about APTs, right? And say, okay, let's, let's pretend the bad guys get a footprint in our network. Right, and now they've got some. They got some stuff. They got some traffic going in and out. Right, command and control traffic, maybe data, data exfiltration. Where would they hide that? Okay, and you brainstorm as a team. If we were the bad guys and we were being really sneaky, where would we put the traffic? And generally, you can either find like a little back door in the network that no one looks at and try to use it so infrequently that nobody notices you're now using it. Or you just say, hey, port 80 and port 443 have a ton of traffic going in and out all day long. We'll hide our traffic in there. And so then the question is, well, what does that look like compared to the other web traffic? And you should also ask your security vendors and consultants for suggestions since you're paying them money and they owe you some free advice. Okay. All right, so into the electronic jungle we go in search of foolish zebras. So if you were to come to me and ask me where a good place to start looking for risky zebras in your port 80 and port 443 traffic, here's what I would tell you. Our suspicious category is a good place to start looking. So what we put in this is sites that we think are up to something. And you can quote me on that. Um, we think this is an elevated risk area, significantly enough elevated risk area. And generally the stuff, we, we try to put stuff in here that we think is probably malicious, but we haven't confirmed it yet. But again, we know they're up to something, right? That's principle one. And we think it's probably malicious. We think it's risky. So we're going to call it suspicious pending more data. Why is it interesting? Because they're up to something, OK? Sorry if that's circular logic. So what I did for, for this is I pretend I, I appointed myself the, uh, the CISO. I was going to be humble and not make myself the CEO of an imaginary corporation of roughly a quarter million active users on a given day. So that's about what how many canine users we'll have that are surfing. And their traffic is easy to break out from the rest of our stuff. And hey, they're getting the software for free. So if I'm using them as guinea pigs, that's their problem. Um, and so out of a quarter of a million approximately users in a 24-hour period, all right, you have to get your Geiger counter. That's what that is. And, and you run the Geiger counter over your zebra herd, and you want to establish a background radiation level. All right, so go click, 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 click. Click. All right, so one click I'm not going to worry about, but this guy worries me because he's, sorry, he's, he's got a lot of clicks. There's something going on there. It's not the normal. 
And so for me, and my corporation of, of, of unincorporated zebras, one to four hits in the logs seem to be a background radiation level. And so this is principle one. You establish what background radiation level is for your herd, because your users are not going to be the same as the canine users, right? So out of two to three hundred thousand users, we have a, we got a couple percent that fall into that activity. So again, 97 plus percent of the users don't have any hits to suspicious sites in a day of surfing. All right, so that helps you kind of say, oh yeah, okay, so if that's the norm, then this is a pretty interesting, right, you're already interested, admit it, you're already interested in wanting to know what these zebras are up to. Now there's a problem here is that I don't have time to investigate almost 6,000 users, right? Right. That's you run into this if you're a sysadmin and you got logs. Your security guy got logs. Look, I don't have time to look at all that stuff. Right. So the principle here is we're going to help you narrow down to something you do have time for. So I, so this is my background level. If I get into the level of five to ten hits, now I'm down to 246 users that fall into that. That's going to be my area of concern. I wish I had time to go in and look at those. I don't today, or any day, but I might tomorrow. Okay. So. What's the contamination level? At some point, there are going to be zebras in my herd that are so frisky in this particular area that they just compel me to go look and see what they're up to. All right, And so I only had 50 that had 10 or more hits. That's a more reasonable number for me to start poking around with. All right, And so this, this is the way you go through this. right? You, you pick an area of interest. If I were a bad guy, I might have traffic over here. And you go look there and you say, OK, yeah, I got some traffic there. How do I know which is the, the right one? Okay, It's the needle in the haystack. We've got this big haystack. Even by taking part of the haystack out and saying, okay, here's my area of interest, it's still too big of a haystack. All right? So I only have time to reach in and grab one or two handfuls of hay. And I have time to look through one of those handfuls of hay before I have to go to my next meeting or whatever. But I don't know that there's going to be a needle in there. By definition, needles are kind of scarce in a lot of these haystacks for the advanced attackers. And so what you want is I want a way to pull a handful of hay and be confident that there, there might be a needle in there. So I'm not wasting my time by looking through it. Right? So that's what this does. We're pretty confident by the time we can zero in on some of these users that there will be something interesting in their traffic. All right, so for the purpose of this particular research, this particular slide, I picked 10 users that all had 30 or more hits to suspicious sites that day. OK, so here's one. Right, so this is this looks interesting. We've got a website that it's got two dot coms, not just one, and six dots, and it's got some interesting stuff with the PHP 53-20. So normally, if I would see two dot coms and some gobbledygook in the middle and a whole bunch of subdomains, I would think this is a phishing site. But there are also sites that before you roll out your version two or version three or whatever version n website is, you want a place to I run it by the stakeholders and get everybody to sign off. But this is, yes, this looks great. Let's roll it out. So you need a place that you can put the website and people can go look at it, but it isn't readily accessible to anybody. And so website design firms will have places like this where they test websites. And I really don't think that kindergarten.com would be a good phishing target. So we'll ignore that and move on. Oh, here's a good one. Zebra number two has 37 hits to this domain. Okay. And this is not like some elite APT domain that I had to X out so you wouldn't know what it was. This is actually the domain name in the logs. Okay. Now, clearly there's something going on with this zebra. All right. But this fails one of the tests of what I'm looking for. Like if I'm looking for an advanced attacker, that to me that implies stealthy. This is not a stealthy domain. Okay. So I'm not expecting this to be some secret APT guy. But I definitely want to. Uh, to poke around a little bit more in that zebra's traffic. Okay. Another guy, 65 hits. It's all to the same domain. We rate it suspicious, and it's apparently a park domain if I go there, right? Google ad, ad bait and stuff. So it's got a weird name. I'm thinking, okay, there's no reason, because there's nothing else on the site. It's just this page that has some Google ad links on it. So there's no reason for the guy to go there 65 times unless there's something on his box that's sending him there 65 times, right? So he's got something on the computer. Next guy, 375 hits to suspicious. You can already see this is way out of line, even with the other foolish zebras, okay? which is, again, something you're looking for. Even within this little group of 10 users that are way out of line with the rest of my user base, 
there are guys within the group of 10 that are way out of line with the other guys, so they're automatically more interesting. And then I see, oh, he's going to a ton of .ru sites. It's a guy in Russia. Well, the .ru world is a garbage dump. And so I'm thinking, okay, that's, that's going to be a piece of work. I don't want to spend time on that guy right now. Let's move on. Okay, this is better. 391 hits to a variety of names. They, they're they're randomish, botnetish looking names that never resolve. Okay, all right, that's good. We like that. And then this was the top guy. 663 hits, short but ugly domain names. Again, they never resolve. Now, I flag three of those with asterisks because that's what I'm looking for. Now, what I'm looking for in my work day is different from what another network guy might be looking for within a specific corporation. What I'm looking for because again, this is the, the suspicious is where we know they're up to something, but we haven't really zeroed in on what. And so this is a great place to go prospecting for breaking botnets, right? Breaking as in the sense of like breaking news, not like that comes later. After we've broken the botnet, then we can break the botnet. So um, clearly all three of these users' computers are infected with something, which i.e. a botnet, it's sending out traffic or trying to send out traffic. And yet... There was no traffic in those three users' logs that day that we rated as botnet. Okay, So clearly, if they've got a bot on their computer, but it's not known by Bluecoat to be a, a bot yet, we have accomplished our mission. We have found three new candidates in less than an hour of searching that give us something to, to go dig into and say, these, these three could be new bots or new versions of bots that we haven't got yet. And it's hard for me, doing normal kinds of searches, to find bots ahead of my bot team. But I try to do that. That's like, this, is, this is like three wins in an hour for me, where I can go to the bot team and say, how come you guys didn't know about this? So that's what, I'm, that's what I'm doing. And so for each of these, you identify the users, you identify the really outlying users, you, pull, you, you, you zero in on what's going on, and then you go look at the rest of their traffic for clues. So these are great examples, again, the example of reaching and pulling out a handful of, hey, when I see a user that's got hundreds of hits to suspicious, I'm very, very confident that when I pull out just his traffic as my little handful of hay and carefully go through it, I will definitely find something interesting. I will not be wasting my time. Yes, question. They weren't suspicious because they were random. Okay. These were these were these were flagged suspicious by one of our automated systems because of you know one or more factors, which might have included. We do have a a, a module, um, actually have a couple of modules that look at the domain name themselves. So if they're using a domain generation algorithm DGA, there are a number of a number of vendors have this. It's not unique to Bluecoat. Um, well, ours we think is cooler than the others, of course. But um, and, and so we applied for a patent on what we're doing because um, we couldn't find any prior art. But yeah, if you, if you say that, you know, all these things, but say they could have been on IPs that we thought were bad, or there could have been other things in the traffic we thought were bad. So this is me cherry picking, right? I'm taking advantage of the fact that some of my stuff has already zeroed in on the traffic and found these as suspicious. And there's nothing to say, right, that one of those 5,980 some users that had like one to four hits wouldn't have something even cooler in their traffic. But I'll get to that tomorrow, right? For, for today, my priority is that I've got to zero in on what the top zebras have going on, deal with that, and then I can reiterate back through. Yes? We have used Splunk for some things. We like Splunk a lot. Um, we run what we call our small cloud logs through Splunk. We have another set of logs that are roughly 20 times the size of our small logs, and we like Splunk well enough with the small logs that we went to Splunk and said, Hey, hypothetically, what would it cost for an annual license for logs of this size? <laughs> I'm like, dude, I could get like five engineers for that. And I would, if you asked me, would you rather have a Splunk for this thing or five? I'd pick the five engineers or the five. I, you know, there's a lot of stuff I would like to analyze. I don't have enough manpower for. So it's like, so then one of the PhD. Now we're getting way off in the weeds, but one of the PhDs on our team um, said, "Well, let's just build one." Okay. This, this, you got to know this guy. So he went and he built one. All right. So, um, and we ran it, we, we, we got it, and that's what we use. We call it Seymour, and that's what we use now as our primary tool. And it's roughly, 
um, 10 to 100 times faster than Splunk on the same size data set. Um, 10 if you're just doing wildcard stuff, and 100 if you're doing complex regexes, which we do a lot. And no, it's not for sale. <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's so customized to what we're doing. You can always, if you're an engineer, it's kind of a truism, you can always build a special purpose tool if the need is great enough. And if you build it for that specific purpose, it will always be faster than a general purpose tool, right? That's, so it's not like it's rocket science. He's just, he's just this maniac that likes to do stuff like this. Right, exactly. It's customized to this form. It's not just customized to the format. It's customized to the kinds of searches we want to do. Okay. Anyway, but Splunk is a great tool. I still use Splunk almost basically every day. Um, so I'm not bad-mouthing Splunk, and it, I don't think they would argue with the fact that somebody could build a special purpose tool that would be faster for some things than there. Right. Anyway, so um, the other thing, the other hint, I already told you, is to look for outliers within outliers. So as an example, that I had to cut from this to make it small enough, but now I'm telling you about it, I'm putting it back in. One of the other categories that's interesting, in fact, I'll just go to this slide because you'll want to write down some of this. This is the, uh, some more things I would tell you to look at that are very interesting in web traffic if you are looking for advanced botnets and stealthy attacks. All right. Um, so malware, if, if malware tends to be sites that will infect you if you go there. Botnet traffic is sites where you're already infected and you're sending traffic to, right? But either of those, if you have computers in your logs that are sending you know, or trying to send, because you're blocking this, right? Trying to send a lot of traffic to either of those categories, there's a pretty good chance the computer's infected, right? In fact, as you would, as you might hope, if you have even even one or two or three hits from a computer to the botnet category in a day, is a pretty good indication that that computer is compromised. All right. So I did the same thing for the RSA. I used the botnet category as another slide. I went in and say, here's the background radiation level one to two. Here's the concern level three to five. Here's the contaminated level six and above for botnet traffic. Okay. And then I pulled the top about you know 20 zebras to look at and the top the top 11 zebras 10 of them had traffic to the same domain all right so again as so I'm doing incident response I don't dive in when I see that you always do the quick survey and you say okay he's got the same thing he's got the same thing I don't have to drill right in and start investigating one of those zebras right away instead all the zebras that have traffic to that domain that day They've got the same botnet infection, right? So I can pool those 10 computers. That goes into bucket A, and I can hand that to my remediation team to say, do a little research, and whatever you, when you figure out what that is, all 10 of those computers have the same thing. I can't help you with that right now because I'm really busy looking at the one out of the 11 that didn't have traffic to that domain. Okay. Again, out of 100 or so zebras that are the most interesting to me, the top 11, 10 of them have traffic to the exact same thing, one guy doesn't, so he is automatically more interesting than the other 10. Okay, He's the outlier within the outliers, and he indeed had something on his computer that was really cool because I could not find any information, either in our database, in our traffic, or anywhere else on the web about that particular domain. Um, so yeah, he had something cool. Anyways, unrated, or some web filters call this miscellaneous because they think it looks better in the reports, um, not naming names. Um, but basically, this, these are the things we don't know about yet. Okay? Now, if you're an advanced bad guy and you've got a footprint in someone's network, I would submit to you that rather than trying to send your traffic out to a known botnet commanded control server, it's much more stealthy to send it out to an unrated domain. Okay? That's a much better place to hide stealthy traffic. Right? Dynamic DNS is a cesspool on the Internet. Um, a couple years ago, I did a study on this, and it was about 10% malicious, 10% useful stuff, I'll say 20 to 30% really shady stuff, another 40% really junk, what am I up to now, 10, okay, and then like 10% marginal useful stuff. Right? And, the, and by shady stuff, I mean like search engine optimization where they're just playing games with Google to try and build up the rank of some other site. Um, these days, it's probably more like 5% useful, 20 to 30% malicious, and about everything else in the middle junk. Um, and so we've, we've reached the point where we just advise our users, you know what, block the dynamic DNS category, all of it. Um, I keep a little blog internally for our engineers where I log incidents where there's been an APT or, or a really stealthy botnet that's used dynamic DNS as either one of the points of infection 
for one of the phone homes, and it's almost always dynamic DNS. And so you can just, just block that. And again, if you've got a zebra that's trying to go to a lot of dynamic DNS stuff, he's infected with something. All right. um, same thing, spam placeholders are interesting, porn adult, hacking, gambling. Because um, hacking is where we put the where stuff. That's where we put sites like the ones I showed you in the first example. They go in the hacking box. And so if you've got a user that's tr always trying to get that stuff, okay, he's going to get infected at some point. If you've got a user that's trying to surf porn a lot, okay, it's not just an HR issue, it's a security issue because we see this over and over. It's a very good lure for the bad guys to get people to come to their sites to infect. And again, you probably can't change that behavior necessarily through policies or, or scolding or whatever, but if you're doing this, you can use that. Okay. And so then the final thing I'll leave you with is this idea that once you have found a foolish zebra that's, that's gotten himself infected with something wonderful once, he can probably do it again. Okay. So you keep a list of your really good malware finding foolish zebras and you check them like every week or two to see what have they been up to today? Have they found something good for me today? Come on, you're not serving fast enough. Get out there and surf some more, you guys. And, and that's how it goes. How, how much time have we got? We got time for, for, we're out of time. If your CEO is a foolish zebra, okay, it's it's hard. So we'll we'll they'll just throw us up here. The idea is you need to have your pool of foolish zebras that are good at finding malware, and you put all of your senior executives into the same pool. You also put your own people, your IT people, your security into the same pool. Politically, that makes the medicine go down a lot better. All right. And then whenever anyone is doing incident investigation and you're looking through the logs and you find a foolish zebra, then you just check, is this a VIP zebra or a normal foolish zebra? Normal foolish zebra means that investigator can go ahead. If it's a VIP zebra, he has to ring the bell and say, ding, 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 I need someone that's authorized to investigate CEO, whatever, traffic. And then you let the VIP know, right, to build awareness, A, this is what my team does all day, and B, hey, maybe this is how they, they tricked you or you know we're investigating this we're not sure how this got into your traffic but help us reconstruct what you were doing right that builds the awareness it might make them into a smarter zebra um, I think that's all the time we have but um, some of this is on our blog um, and I'll be happy to take questions if you have them um, I don't because I'm not an incident responder I spend my day looking in the aggregate traffic logs of all of our users trying to sift out what's normal from what isn't and then drill in on what isn't to see if I can get ahead of the infection or the botnet early enough to warn them. So what do you do about, what do you do about the user that now you found out that they're a foolish zebra? Nothing. Because I've tried. I've gone down the hall to Todd's office and say, Todd, I've got an infected canine user. What do I do? And he says, Nothing. Yeah. Well, and right now, if I find something that I think is an advanced attack, because it's only in the traffic of one of my big corporate users, I still don't know which corporate user that is. We try to keep it that way on purpose, but I do throw that over the wall to say, pull this license and alert their field engineer that they need to take a look at this. I got to do that, man. Yes. What do you mean? All I have to work with are blue coat logs. That's who I am. I mean, I don't because that's not who. Again, that's not who I am. I'm in charge of the blue coat web filter traffic to make sure that we're catching as much as we can and flagging it. Yeah. So, so now we don't get the customer's proxy SG logs, right? Because that's theirs. There's no way they're going to give us that traffic. But the way the web filter is set up, when it hits a site that is not in the database, it asks the cloud if that's how you've configured it. And we and we'd say, please configure it that way or that we can't keep you safe from all the stuff that we catch dynamically. We can't put everything we know about the malware world into the database. And for some customers, that's a big leap to go from a 10 year ago privacy security balance where they could say, we'll let the database protect us, but we're not going to send you any of our traffic at all because, oh, there could be passwords in the query strings. 
Canine logs are, are come to us because that's the way it works. It's a cloud system. We're not going to give you a copy of our database on your local computer. Sorry. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so I was using canine logs because they're very, A, they're very convenient for me. I can, I can separate them out very simply from everybody else and make them my little corporation. And because they are local admin password holding users, in a lot of cases, they can do stuff like the first one I told you. And I see that on a regular basis where they do override the blocks, even though we've warned them. And I could tell you, again, I could tell you Fully Zebra stories for hours. Um, but we can use that, you know, I can use that ability. And so I still do this on a regular basis. I, this is my own dog food. I mean, I'll, if I'm doing an investigation on malware A, and I see that there's a canine user that's in the thick of that traffic, I will come back after I wrap up investigation on malware A and I'll start malware investigation B based on that guy and what else he's got going on. And they always, they always give you good stuff. That's what they do. Yes. And they're an asset. They really are. That's, you, you can't pay people to test your stuff, but they'll do it for free.